Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder, violence, and child abuse. From the outside, it looked like a lovely romantic evening. It was Friday, May 4th, 2001. Robert Blake, a 67-year-old actor and a newlywed, took Bonnie Lee Bakley, his 44-year-old wife, out to dinner at Vitello's, which was one of his favorite restaurants. The staff there knew Blake well. One of his favorite quirks was to add sautéed spinach and tomato sauce to a dish. They took to calling that request Robert Blaking an entree. They also enjoyed kidding around with him. When he came in that night, one of the owners of the place, Steve Restivo, joked with Blake about the actor's preference for liking his chicken broth plain, with no vegetables. Restivo remembered, too, that the couple seemed to be in a good mood. But, as well as he knew Blake, Restivo didn't know that the woman he was with was his wife, or even that Blake was married at all. That's because sometimes appearances can be deceiving. Blake wasn't happy being married to Bakley. He didn't even have her live in his house. And, in just a few hours, she would be dead. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We're the murder sheet, and this is A Night Out at Vitello's, Robert Blake and the Murder of Bonnie Lee Bakley. Robert Blake is one of those celebrities who seems to somehow stay in the background of pop culture for generations. Someone who just always seems to be there. He got his start in show business way back in the late 1930s. First attracting attention is Mickey, one of the starring kids in the R Gang series of short films. Anya and I recently made the mistake of watching that entire series in order. Blake makes his debut towards the very end of the franchise. Behind the scenes, though, his life wasn't glamorous at all. Blake claimed that his parents treated him horribly, abusing and belittling him. After the R Gang series ended, Blake's career continued at a lower ebb, but he still appeared in a variety of television shows and movies. He did not, however, make another big splash until 1967, when he played the role of murderer Perry Smith in the film version of In Cold Blood. Soon after that, he landed the starring role in Beretta, a 70s cop series. Blake played a tough, streetwise cop with a pet bird. Neither of us have ever seen an episode of this program, but it was a modest hit, lasting for four seasons. It's the role Blake is perhaps best remembered for today. By the mid-80s, Blake was ready for another series. Bizarrely enough, he was reportedly considered for the role of David Addison on Moonlighting. That part, of course, ended up going to Bruce Willis, and made him a star. Blake, meanwhile, got the lead role on the short-lived series Helltown. And his star seemed to land in perdition, too, after that. Blake's career sputtered along. He played Jimmy Hoffa in one TV movie, 
played murderer John List in another, and he got a part in a David Lynch film. But he was clearly nowhere near the star he had once been. And then, in 1999, he met Bonnie Lee Bakley, an attractive blonde 23 years his junior. In November of 2000, not long after Bonnie gave birth to Blake's daughter, she and the actor got married. And now, on May 4th, 2001, the couple was out, seemingly enjoying a relaxing dinner at Vitello's. But, just as there was darkness beneath the surface of Blake's outwardly happy career as a child star, there were troubles behind the scenes for Blake and his bride. According to Blake, Bonnie thought she was in great danger and actually felt in fear of her life. To some extent, Blake claimed, he shared those concerns. He had gotten worried after noticing strangers hanging out near his house. Because of all this, Blake took the precaution of carrying a gun with him when they went out to the restaurant, carefully tucking it into his waistband. The meal passed without incident, and the couple walked together back to Blake's car, which was parked about a block away. And that was when Blake says he realized there was a problem. He didn't have his gun. It must have slipped out of his waistband back at the restaurant. He told Bonnie to wait in the car while he went and retrieved it. And that seems rather strange to us. The entire reason he claimed to have his gun with him was because he felt Bonnie's life was in danger, that he needed to be armed to protect her. So why on earth was he now leaving her alone in a car while he traipsed a block back to the restaurant? It doesn't seem to make sense. But that is what Blake says happened. He went back to Vitello's and picked up his gun. At least that is what he claims he did. No one seems to have turned up who actually saw Blake do this. After he retrieved his gun, Blake, he claims, returned to his car. He got into the car on the driver's side, leaned over to pick up the car keys from the floor, and that is when he noticed something wrong with his wife. Bonnie was leaning over, bleeding from a gunshot wound to the head. At first, Blake said later, he didn't understand what he saw. He claimed he shook his dying wife, telling her, wake up, tuts. But she didn't wake up. And it was then, Blake said, he noticed the blood oozing from her nose. Blake realized then that something terrible had happened. There was a cell phone in Bonnie's purse, right within Blake's reach. He could have used it to call 911, to get help to his injured wife as quickly as possible. But he didn't do that. Some people theorized that this was because he wanted to delay aid getting to her. But Blake would deny that. He said it was because he just never understood how to use her cell phone. So instead, he raced to a home across the street and began pounding on the door, searching for help. When Sean Stanick opened the door, he saw Blake pleading for Stanick to call 911. You gotta help me. You gotta help me. Stanick threw on some clothes and raced out to Blake's car, where he discovered Bonnie, struggling to breathe. He also noticed that her car window was down and, strangely enough, Blake was not there. He did not come back for a few minutes. Apparently, oddly enough, he walked back the block or so to Vitello's. This time, people saw him there. Joe Restivo, Steve's brother, described what happened to the Los Angeles Times. Blake said, My wife, she got hurt or we got mugged or something. I said, You want me to call 911? He said we did already. The guy was nuts. Meanwhile, Stanick concentrated on Bonnie. I tried to talk to her, he told the Los Angeles Times. I said, what's your name? Can you hear me? If you can hear me, please just squeeze my hand. Bonnie's hand remained limp in Stanek's grasp. Within minutes, police and medical personnel were at the scene. By this time, Blake had returned. One of the area's residents told People magazine later, 
that they saw Blake walking up and down the street, looking upset and even vomiting. The cops were treating him with kid gloves, said this resident. For most of the time, paramedics were working on Bakley. He was just sitting on the curb. An officer had his arm around him, just consoling him. The medics worked on Bonnie for about 10 minutes before taking her to the hospital, where she soon died. Blake later admitted he regretted not holding Bonnie's hand at the hospital. Back at the murder site the next day, police would soon discover an unregistered gun in a dumpster near Blake's car. It still had a bullet in the chamber, and that bullet matched the casings left at the scene. Police began to wonder, could the famous actor Robert Blake have actually killed his own wife? And who was Bonnie Lee Bakley anyway? Why might Blake have wanted her dead? It can frankly be a bit difficult to figure out the truth about Bonnie Lee Bakley because, in the years after her murder, Robert Blake and his attorneys made a concerted effort to portray her in the absolute worst terms possible. They did this not only to suggest that many, many people might have had a reason to kill her, but perhaps to also imply that she deserved to die. Bonnie Lee Bakley did not deserve to die. But she was, it seems fair to say, a complicated and troubled woman. At the time of her death, the 44-year-old Bakley had been married 10 times. Bonnie started life with big dreams. According to the LA Times, she wanted to be a female Donald Trump. She adored him, Bonnie's sister told the paper. Not for his looks, but for his intelligence. And so, to be like Trump... Bonnie tried to hustle and do what she could to make money and become famous. She was especially interested in show business. She longed to be famous. At first, she tried to earn fame herself. She actually, at one point, made a record. But nothing came of it. Perhaps it was around this time that she realized she could still become famous by virtue of association if she at least attached herself to celebrities. And she had a pretty good idea of how she could do that. In her efforts to make a dollar, she had learned she was quite good at finding ways to get close to men, and then rip them off. Bonnie started off relatively slow. Larry Hackett from People magazine explained her initial strategy to ABC News. She decided to put ads in Swinger magazines. She would use different names and different professions and come up with a variety of reasons as to why she needed money. For instance, she might say she was in nursing school and needed money to pay for tuition. When men inevitably replied to her advertisements, Bonnie would send them provocative pictures of herself to keep them on the hook and interested. And to keep them sending her money. And there was even a darker side. She allegedly manipulated some of these older men to put her in their wills or to add her on their life insurance. As time went on, these schemes of hers became more and more complicated. To lend credence to the various identities she assumed, Bonnie began doing things like forging driver's licenses. This, of course, was fraud, and Bonnie eventually faced criminal charges for it. Over the years, she also faced charges on drug offenses and for passing bad checks. She never faced many legal consequences, though. And meanwhile, her desire to get close to celebrities continued to grow and grow. Of course, an average person, even one as determined as Bonnie Lee Bakley, can't easily access someone who is currently a huge star. None of us, in short can hope to wake up tomorrow and suddenly become best friends forever with Taylor Swift or have a night out on the town with Daniel Craig. But the opportunities grow if you set your sights a bit lower. If you focus on getting close to someone who once was a star 
but has since lost a lot of their luster. With that in mind, Bonnie went after people like Jerry Lee Lewis or Dean Martin, both performers who still had a glow of celebrity, even though their best days were long behind them. And Bonnie realized something else. Perhaps she couldn't hope to get close to a superstar like Marlon Brando, but maybe she could become friendly with his son. At the time, Christian Brando was serving a prison term for manslaughter. Bonnie began sending him nude pictures of herself, and an intrigued Christian met her in person soon after he was released from prison. The two quickly began a sexual relationship. It was around this time that Bonnie met Robert Blake. She began a sexual relationship with him, too. Blake later claimed he felt she manipulated him into getting physical with her. But if so, it didn't seem as if it were that difficult for her to do. I didn't have much of a life, Blake said. My kids were grown and gone. I was very, very single. A loner. And suddenly, an attractive woman, 23 years his junior, seemed interested in him and wanted to take him to bed. He did not turn her down. At least not when she wanted him to make love with her. There was at least one sexual offer from Bonnie that Blake said he did refuse, though. Once, he claimed, she joked with him that he seemed to find her teenage daughter more attractive than her. You could have sex with her, she told him. Blake said he turned her down. If Blake's story about Bonnie trying to pimp her child to him is actually true, then it seems difficult to imagine why he would keep her in his life after she made such an offer. But he did. Maybe he did so because, as he seemed to suggest, he was old and lonely and horny. At times, Blake appeared to endorse that view, saying that Bonnie was the type of woman a man such as himself liked best. She would gratify his needs and then just get back on the bus. But maybe he had some genuine feelings for her. He would later say that she was smart and could, quote, charm the eyes off a rattlesnake. He would even admit that he loved her, but stress that loving a person was very different from being in love with them. Poets have written sonnets for a thousand years about being in love, said Blake. A lot of people say, I love my husband, I love my wife, but I believe they really mean they're in love with their husband or wife which is quite different from loving your dog. Sometime in the midst of all this, Bonnie Lee Bakley became pregnant. She decided that the father just had to be Christian Brando. It probably excited her that she was carrying the grandchild of the great actor Marlon Brando. When her daughter was born in June of 2000, she named her Christian Shannon Brando. But then she started to wonder if Robert Blake was actually the father. Blake asked for a paternity test, which determined beyond doubt the child was in fact his. So Bonnie changed the child's name to Rose Lenore Sophia Blake. So now what? Blake's attorneys and allies would say that the actor was determined to do the so-called right thing to marry Bonnie and take responsibility for the child. And of course, Bonnie had always wanted to get married to a celebrity, so she, of course, would also be in favor of marriage. One might think the actor would have some doubts. Blake, after all, knew Bonnie was a troubled and complex woman with many problems. But he claims he honestly believed that that would all change if she became his wife. He said, I thought all that baggage would fall off. But Blake did more than just think it. He took concrete steps to try to control the situation and to ensure that he would come out ahead if things got bad. He said he would only marry Bonnie if she consented to sign a custody agreement concerning their daughter. 
Bonnie took the proposed agreement to divorce lawyer Carrie Goldstein. In my 25-year career, said Goldstein, I've never seen an agreement as abusive and controlling as this. The agreement said that any visits Bonnie had with their daughter would have to be supervised, that her family and friends could never enter the grounds of Blake's property without express written permission, and that if Bonnie got tossed into jail for a crime, she would lose all custody rights to their daughter. Goldstein felt that the agreement was basically nothing more than a scheme for Blake to take the child from Bonnie and not have to pay child support. The lawyer refused to endorse such a one-sided agreement. So Bonnie simply got herself another attorney who didn't have such qualms. Goldstein understood her determination in the matter. Bonnie wanted to marry a celebrity, and she did, said Goldstein. But she told me one time, if anything happens to me, Blake is responsible. So the couple got married. But Blake seemed early on to have strong reservations about how close he wanted to be to Bonnie. He made her live in his guest house, and even her family recognized there were problems in the relationship. Bonnie's sister once overheard the couple fight over the phone. He could be real nasty, recalled Bonnie's mother, and sometimes he would be sweet. She liked him when he was sweet. I told her that he's an actor, and how is she going to know when he's acting? It was an excellent question. But it seemed clear early on that Blake regretted his marriage to Bonnie and did not wish to spend the rest of his life tethered to her. The one-sided custody agreement makes that perfectly clear. Eric Dubin, an attorney who later represented Bonnie's family, claimed that Blake also started cooking up a variety of schemes to get Bonnie in trouble, and therefore out of his life. Dubin claims that Blake tried to plant illegal drugs in Bonnie's car. When that didn't work, Blake kicked things up a notch. This is when he is alleged to have decided to kill her. Or, to be more accurate, it was when he is said to have decided to have her killed. Two different stuntmen, Gary McLarty and Ronald Hamilton, came forward and claimed that Blake had offered them $10,000 to murder Bonnie. They turned him down. So, according to prosecutors, Blake decided to do the job himself. Police arrested him in 2002 and charged him with murder. He was brought to trial in 2005. Prosecutors presented the testimony of McLarty and Hambleton. They pointed out that much of Blake's story about the night of May 4, 2001, simply did not make sense. How, for instance, could a gun have slipped out of his waistband without him noticing it? Why didn't anyone see him go back to the restaurant to retrieve his weapon? Blake said he got back into the car without noticing Bonnie had been shot, but there was blood in the vehicle and none on Blake, so it didn't seem as if he was in the car at all. Remember, too, that after the shooting, Blake admitted he did not offer any comfort to the dying woman he supposedly loved. Instead, Witnesses recalled him pacing up and down the street, even vomiting. A deputy L.A. County District Attorney said this was because, quote, Blake shot people on TV. He shot people in the movies. But he never really shot a person in real life. It freaked him out. Prosecutors offered all of this and more to a jury. And the jury chose to acquit Blake. Jurors said they just didn't believe McLarty or Hambleton's testimony. They also said that the prosecution hadn't succeeded in definitively putting the gun in Blake's hands. L.A. County District Attorney Steve Cooley, on the other hand, said that the jurors were incredibly stupid. He added, Quite frankly, based on my review of the evidence, Blake is as guilty as sin. He is a miserable human being. Meanwhile... Blake gave a rambling press conference immediately after his acquittal. Here is part of what he said. 
My whole life is a blessing for all the times I should have been dead and, or not even born. If you want to know how to go through $10 million in five years, ask me. I'm broke. I need a job. What did Johnny Cochran say? You're innocent until proven broke. I was a rich man. I'm broke now. I'm going to go out and do a little cowboying. You know what that is? Cowboying is getting in a motor home or a van or something like that. And you just let the air blow in your hair and wind up in some little bar in Arizona someplace. You shoot one-handed nine ball with some 90-year-old Portuguese woman who beats the hell out of you. And the next day you wind up in a park someplace playing chess with somebody. And you go see a high school play where they're doing West Side Story. We don't know if Blake ever got to go cowboying, but we do know that his legal woes were far from over. Three of Bonnie's children filed a civil suit against Blake, alleging that he was responsible for the death of their mother. This time around, things did not go Blake's way. A jury found him liable for Bonnie's wrongful death and ruled that he had to pay her children $30 million. A few months later, Blake filed for bankruptcy. He doesn't appear to have acted in any television program or movies since the late 1990s. His IMDb credits come to a complete halt after 1997. If Robert Blake were ever to admit he killed Bonnie, he would surely claim he did it for love of his infant daughter, that he worried living with a troubled Bonnie would expose their child to all sorts of dark anxieties, and that he feared Bonnie would drain his bank account and take away his ability to financially care for their child. The ironic thing is that Blake forced an even worse fate on his daughter. She now must somehow live with the knowledge that her father very likely killed her mother, and the trials and the civil judgment against him left Blake broke unable to truly give his daughter the security she deserved. In the final analysis, Blake was much worse for his daughter than Bonnie Lee Bakley ever could have been. The victim blaming that went on in the press in this case was not okay, but Bonnie Bakley's frankly predatory behavior does warrant scrutiny. But whatever flaws she had, Murder has a sort of weird effect on life. When you decide to take the life of another, you're going to end up cast in the role of the bad guy, whether you like it or not. The scene will fade from a complicated muddle of colors into black and white, stark as an old movie. This case was extensively covered in the press at the time, and has also been covered extensively afterwards. For this episode, we relied on coverage appearing in the Tampa Times. We also relied on the work that Ali Yang and Gail Deutsch did for ABC News, and that Greg Reisling did for the Associated Press, and work that Lisa Sweetingham did for Court TV and CNN. We'd also like to give credit to Christine Pelisek of People Magazine, as well as a whole crew of reporters from the Los Angeles Times, including Andrew Blankstein, Caitlin Liu, Richard Fawcett, Jean Giacchione, Michael Krikorian, Joe Matthews, and Kurt Streeter. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>